And we're live. I hope I got this one right. I have to listen back to the last episode to, time. to see if we got the timing, see mm -hmm. exactly where it's at, and then just kind of look back at like when I actually started the long breath before, before we'll it out. starting right. the episode. But we're back at it again a month in a row. A lot of people are reaching out and thanking us i actually had a few comments like hey man you guys have been banging it out we really appreciate it so thank you for the love and for uh sending it to us and that makes us want to get back on that much more how you doing sean yeah just like riffing off what you just said is like having people uh, reach out about the podcast is definitely added motivation for us to keep up with it stay consistent with it so uh, yeah, those messages and everything you're sending to us. Meanwhile, we're trying to keep this rolling. Uh, it's gonna it's gonna help with that momentum. So your support is greatly appreciated. But uh, yeah, things are good, man. I feel like I'm getting into a good routine here, uh, having fun with uh, my own training and figuring out the the right way to balance my days. And you know what's been the most difficult thing for me is like learning how to manage my energy between like training uh work related stuff with like Muay Thai guy knock one nation yada yada and then also some type of uh social life just with my relationship with more so just like my wife Liz and I'm I'm starting to figure it out um I know whenever I start to figure out though some something fucking happens so I'm trying to stay uh vigilant if you, you know what I mean and I'm sure you're probably getting into some type of flow as well out in Phuket right yeah, for sure. Uh, what you were talking about definitely rings a bell because I feel like throughout the days, I just make the decision to do everything and that I'm going to. So I, I, I was thinking about this today. I'm like, I wonder if Sean gets this. Like I, I have this like empty feeling of energy, kind of like one of those where you feel like you're completely spent, but you're like, still motivated inside your mind and it's like mm -hmm. this hollow feeling inside the body now i'm not sure if that's something like oh we forget to eat and not eat enough and i'm actually hollow inside because <laughs> i'm running around all day doing things and worrying about stuff and you know trying to create things and still get a full day of training in but it, it's like this hollow energy where like your mind is like screaming for you to go and you're just like running on these fumes but it's uh it's like a really good feeling it's kind of like a fulfilling feeling that you're checking things off from uh multiple aspects of your life you know yeah what i've realized uh recently so yoga or uh, liz has just went on a uh, yoga teacher training just like a week long just to like oh. get away change up the routine and everything and uh it's definitely helped us kind of like reset because we were staying up a little too late and just like falling into uh, I don't want to say complacency or bad habits, but like not productive habits, not the the best habits. And so this has kind of allowed us to to reset and figure out the best ways that uh, we work as like uh, separate entities and that we can come together and make sure that we're keeping the right balance between each other, between our work, between our training and uh, everything. And someone mentioned in the YouTube comments, like also recovery, just balancing recovery and make you're getting enough sleep you're getting massages if you're here in thailand lucky enough to be here in thailand just doing the things stretching uh that can often be overlooked and just like being in your life like it's so easy nowadays i know we're kind of like getting into this uh different topic than the main portion but i think this is important to talk about is that with social media and with the way that the world is right now and so many people are just stuck in one spot and it, it can get a little mundane with the day to day it's so important to be in your life and not just be on the social media life all the time because it can be so mm. easy to live for social media that you forget to actually like live your life and then you're just trying to do things just to post on social media as opposed to just doing things because you like them and you don't feel like you need to share them on social media does that make any sense yeah, hundred percent. I feel like any time that I force myself to get off the phone, not uh, be checking in on these things, I I feel completely different. I feel like I have different moods and like expectations for myself, and I'm just thinking about things and that that whole comparison thing. Uh, I mean, I'm a I'm a motherfucker when it comes to my mind and like stopping certain thoughts or like you know just ending 
thought patterns just as they kind of come up in my head like oh this doesn't help me in any way to think about this it's not productive mm -hmm. um but man i can't imagine being like a younger girl in this age and have it like just oh. having a regular day and everything like in your life that's what i try to remind myself is like when i go through the day i think about like physically in my life if if i didn't have my cell phone today if i didn't look at it today like what would i feel like and most of the time i would feel super grateful for everything that's around me mm -hmm. yeah it's so funny that i mean back in the day before there were cell phones and shit you used to like just not be connected all the time and now it's just like such a side piece that you have with you all times just always uh something that can kill your attention that can uh, take your attention and just like not be in the present moment and i think it's really important to just uh, i just think remember and like you were saying i was actually i was just uh <clears throat> had a video call with my uh my niece and nephew this past weekend and <clears throat> i was talking to my my brother and my sister-in-law who are teachers in new york and they're talking about just like kids growing up right now who are like teenagers and everything and how crazy it must be for them not being able to go to school not being able to socialize when the social life is like top priority in like those teenager years you know what i mean and they're not able to do that they're not able to like interact with people it must be it must be so wild interacting just on social media it's like it's great that we have it because it helps keep people connected and everything but it also detracts from the person to person physical connection and just being present it's such a distraction man i've been trying to like uh set a uh hard time limit on how long i'm on my phone and check it at the end of every week and try to figure out some type of system to just make sure i'm not obsessing because like i don't know if you watch the social dilemma on netflix but that that fucked with my mind a little bit too just because like i mean they're just paying for our attention they're, they're like trying to get our attention on everything yeah it's kind of crazy to think about especially with the two of us working on social media and working so, on so online weird. platforms yeah. and marketing and things like that because i i enjoy a lot of the challenges of it and things like that but when it comes to that aspect uh i've been getting a lot better at just like going in putting up something positive something inspirational like thinking about my day like what i can share with others and then if i come by any information to like leave some love and then just try to leave it at that and just bounce out. And I feel like that's been really helpful. Yeah, I can definitely resonate with that. But uh, anyway, so this topic was kind of last minute, not gonna lie, because the, the time zone in Thailand just always fucks with me. And we were supposed to be interviewing Miriam Nakamoto, who is a OG in the sport. She's uh, just a badass, probably has a lot of interesting stories we haven't heard of yet, but we'll be interviewing her next Tuesday uh well wednesday morning our time thailand time and tuesday night uh most people in like the u.s time zone and so that'll be interesting so we put this one together because we got a lot of questions on instagram uh when we asked about what we should talk about tonight and a lot of them related to cross training different martial arts and different training methods and so i'm always interested to just discuss this a little bit more because i think this was actually one of our earlier podcasts that we talked about like cross training in muay thai this kind of goes along the same lines because it's martial arts and muay thai but uh we've i, I saw someone on instagram post that they're starting from episode number one and that kind of made me cringe to be honest I'm like oh man i must fucking sound like such an idiot back then <laughs> and just thinking about like all this shit we probably used to say but uh yeah so what what do you think what do you think people should consider when they're thinking about training other martial arts it, like obviously their goals are important but is there anything else that they should be considering when it comes to just trying to round out their game yeah i think it's really important to look at what you want to excel in in the end you know looking at the end goal and then what we've talked about before is like reverse engineering it that way mm -hmm. and i had an interesting conversation with eddie he was talking about uh you know like i'm a southpaw and he was talking about that which a lot and he says he's seen a lot of guys and trained a lot of guys that like to be in one stance and then they switch to southpaw and they've spent pretty much 50 50 the, like the amount of time in each stance and they're they never like really mastered a technique from one side and then they 
bring over this watered down version to the other side of their body. And then they, they don't become exactly as proficient as they should be. And he really thinks that before you become a Southpaw, you should like pretty much master what you're naturally good at first. And then you teach them how to like put in those trick shots or be able to switch stance. Cause even when you do, then you're uh, like so proficient at it from one side that you understand the mechanics, like with the timing and how to throw everything from the other side. And I would have a really hard time. Like whenever I go orthodox, uh, things are, are, are really tough. Like I, I'm sure if I drilled it from the beginning, I'd be a little bit more proficient at it. But I do understand what he means because when I do go orthodox and I switch my stance, then my timing is really good on my switch kick, my timing on my teeps and things like that. So like those principles of like having really good timing on your kick, when to kick and uh, distance management and all these different things that like if you settle in one place and you really learn it to a masterful level, I feel like you can kind of bring it over to, uh, you know, like adding in these little flavors and just kind of sprinkling it on. And uh, we had another conversation when he asked me, like, how do you feel going into boxing and then switching back to Muay Thai, which I think relates to you as well, because you started with boxing. How much do you feel like it influenced your game? Because I feel like it was a huge influence earlier on. And then once you reached a certain professional level, you're like, oh, like I have to blend this in a completely different way. Yeah, I mean, well, first off, boxing and muay thai like are different sports and like to the outside eye if you're not involved with either of the sports it kind of looks the same because you're punching each other right but when it comes to the stance the angles the footwork the movement the head movement it's all completely different and so i had to completely relearn uh like everything once i went from boxing to muay thai slash like mma striking and it was really insightful because I realize how th there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences too. And a lot of uh, subtle nuances that you probably wouldn't know unless you were able to do one or the other, if you're trained in one or the other. I know that earlier on my career, I definitely uh, relied on my hands, um, but I've always been kind of hand oriented. I just think the boxing helped uh, speed up the process and like make it a little bit better when I did do Muay Thai because I always, so most of my knockouts, like 95% of my knockouts besides one have been from my right hand. And, and I really believe a lot of it has to do with, I played baseball growing up and I was a pitcher. And so it's just like that, that right hand motion was drilled into me. So you talk about training other martial arts, what about just like other sports and stuff and how they kind of translate into Muay Thai. But when I wanted to really become good at Muay Thai, or when I realized that in order to become good at Muay Thai, I had to not just be a boxer, I had to be a well-rounded fighter. Uh, that's when I was able to see real growth in my game and become more confident in other areas of my game and not rely on just like my boxing or my right hand. And it's funny because like, I don't know if this happens with you, uh, but you go in phases, right? Where like, your your foot like i i've been in phases where i'm really focusing on my hands and like trying to really work on my boxing but then there's other times during training all i'm doing is kicking and teeping and i forget that i even have like this ability to to punch people sometimes because i'm so focused on improving other aspects of the game do you, you kind of go through the same uh waves of sometimes you're boxing sometimes you're kicking sometimes you're doing just orthodox whatever maybe I did in the past, however many years leading up, probably into the last year and a half where I try to like really round out my game and not make as many mistakes and utilize my advantages to their maximum. Because mm -hmm. I felt like in the beginning, I was utilizing my life and, and really like sticking long punches out and just to finish with knees and, you know, read the body, which is, you know, where my name came from in the beginning. And then I try to focus more on kicks because my hips were so tight. Then I try to focus more on different areas. And then I felt like I started to make mistakes when I started to focus on like these weak points so much that like I completely forgot about my strengths and never really like went back to them to like re-strengthen them. I was just so focused on those weak areas to just like round myself out. But now I'm more focused on like just making sure um 
putting it all together really well. And that's what I feel like in, in this whole topic of like bringing in different martial arts or different tricks into the game of Muay Thai. What I find to be the scariest is a guy that has like super rock solid fundamentals. Like if I'm sparring a guy and he's super well balanced, the guy is fainting a lot. So he's making me think a lot. When I'm hitting him, he's super well balanced. So I, I don't think as quickly when it comes to the tricks. I'm just trying to land that first jab. I'm trying to land that first teep and the first kick before I'm thinking about anything else. So once that guy implements his game and has that rock, rock solid foundation, once they bring something unique on top of that and they set it up with that like super solid jab, super solid teep, they fake it into something more spectacular, then that's when it's a real problem. I feel like that's where you should be sprinkling on the other martial arts well something that came to mind when you said that was nikki holskin because he has rock solid foundations and he is like kickboxer yeah. right but then he has these crazy ass wheel and spinning kicks that you don't kind of expect him to throw unless you know him as a fighter now but he's so like solid in his kickboxing stance that when he just unwinds these fucking like beautifully uh executed kicks they kind of come out of nowhere and catch people off guard that's kind of what i feel like i mean kind of backtracking to what we initially started with was like you got to know your goals and like what you're trying to do you're listening to a muay thai podcast right now so the chances are you want to get good at muay thai are other martial arts going to help you with that yes but it, it's easy to uh I mean, this isn't anything in life. Have that shiny object syndrome where like there's something new and you feel like you, you hit a plateau in Muay Thai. So you want to try different things to sprinkle them in with your Muay Thai. But I just found that like <clears throat> sometimes the most light bulb moments come from that grind of just repetition, monotonous repetition. And that's when you like break through. Will other martial arts help you with that? Yeah, of course. But like you said, I think just like you can never get good enough at the basics and the fundamentals. And until you feel like relatively competent with that, I think it will be I don't think it will be detrimental, but I don't think it will be as uh, efficient to be training in other martial arts while you're just trying to still uh, grasp a really good understanding of the fundamentals. I just started this new process for the striking academy and it came up as a thought because of how I've been training more recently, just trying to like systemize it all together because that's how my mind works is like building from step one to step two to step three, like what has to be good before the next thing happens and just frustrations maybe with coaches before like teaching me certain techniques when maybe certain other parts of my game weren't ready yet like i wasn't fast enough to do these things yeah i wasn't balanced enough to do them i was just throwing them with power and one thing i found to be like really helpful is feeding movement with movement which is something uh, i learned from kieran just kind of like throwing things and uh to like create comfortable momentum for the next weapon and if i can teach my body to move a certain way and then I master that kind of like flow and rhythm, which the ties are masters at themselves. And, and then I feel comfortable enough to do it where I don't feel like I'm forcing it every like one movement just kind of feeds the next. And then those weapons just come out. Then that's where I start adding those things like the spinning elbows and, uh, you know, like flying knees and things like that. And it's only when I get that right feeling because I don't feel like. I'm explosive enough to kind of like do it from this like standstill position where I'm staring at you and then like, pop, you know, like Roy Jones Jr. puts his hands behind his back. Everything's at a standstill. And then he explodes so fast that I can't even follow how fast that lead hook comes. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't feel like I have that athleticism. So it has to come from that rock solid foundation of like learning that perfect foundational movement. And then it's like, Swoop. OK, we just changed it up into a different weapon. And that's when the fancy stuff can come in and i feel like you still need your style and uh that, that's a really good listen i was telling you about it that roy jones uh podcast with um joe so you guys should head over and listen to that episode right after the muay thai guys episode of like how you can 
mold character and studying different things like even fighting chickens into your fighting style so is it beneficial 100 percent to to study other things so that your style becomes formed in a very unique way where like yeah everybody has to have a solid balance solid check solid defense solid offense and then what makes you you is the style that you bring into it and different inspirations even from things like movies books or yourself playing baseball prior yeah i think it's just a combination it's just like yeah being a, a student of life and being able to implement whatever aspects of life you're experiencing in with your muay thai training because i mean you're, we're always trying to find our own unique styles and that's kind of what martial arts is and, and muay thai is you're trying to create your own uh style of of fighting and trying to express yourself through your style of fighting and so if you have other martial arts backgrounds obviously you're going to have a little bit different uh things up your sleeve whether you were taekwondo background and you have some spinning kicks or if you were i don't know a, a boxing background and your hands are a little bit more crisp but when it comes to muay thai i mean like the in the end <clears throat> when people ask me like if they should cross train or, or do anything um it really comes down to like first just do muay thai as much as you fucking can until you feel like all right i get I have a good understanding of it now i can add some other things now when it comes to adding other things paul what do you think are some of the martial arts that are best supplemental to the muay thai training if i was gonna say anything honestly the first thing that jumped into my mind wasn't even a martial art it was gymnastics looking mm -hmm. at chris mouseri looking at gsp guys like that and, and just the athleticism of those guys is uh the balance that they bring in i feel like it's something unparalleled he just posted that reposted his fight with nick chastin and that's the number one thing i see when his stalking him that's a bigger opponent uh you know explosive opponent who's been very successful in glory now and chris as the smaller guy just walked him down and like walked through all, it's not that he was walking through all the shots but him being so balanced and Nick having to like back up and punch on his heels while his moving his feet took so much power away where Chris, like the second he sees a shot, his feet are planted exactly where they need to be. His body is aligned exactly how it needs to be. So I would say uh, if it comes to like athleticism, I think gymnastics would be number one. And then number two, if it comes to martial arts, I feel like a lot of guys uh, are good at blending like Taekwondo or, boxing in, into muay thai but again i think if if you're very flexible and mobile taekwondo would be the way to do it and then if you're someone that's more like eastern european minded like myself or like a russian fighter that's like super solid at you know just throwing the jab a thousand times a day then uh sharpening up those punches in the head movement where uh you're it, it's really tight for muay thai Mm, yeah i think boxing is a really uh i mean obviously we, we both have some boxing experience and we both have benefited greatly from it because it just opens our eyes to different ways to utilize that in, in the muay thai ring but taekwondo is something i kind of uh miss missed out on and i i wish that it was something that i was able to practice as a kid i wish it was something that i even knew about as a kid but it was never on the radar and same with karate and stuff i mean i'm not too familiar with karate and the different styles of it and uh how they're unique and how they would uh, blend into muay thai but i'm sure there are styles i mean you see guys like Stephen one boy thompson who is a kickboxer and a mma fighter but he's primarily a karate fighter and it's just anything can work if you just like dedicate to that if you find your style to it and if you're able to blend it into whatever sport that you're doing but like you said i think um when it comes down to it like just uh doing more research on strength and conditioning uh with like don he trick and just getting a better understanding of the sport talking with lawrence kenshin about certain uh aspects of the strength game a lot of it comes down to just like athleticism and strength and just like whoever is the better fit fighter uh obviously technique and everything are going to have roles in that like there's but at some point when the techniques are like of equal skill the the stronger person like the the christmas seri in the instance that you were saying the guy who's more rooted down and able to force his hand in the in the fight is gonna be able to outlast their opponent especially when it comes to like cardio and that kind of stuff as well and so when it comes to training other martial arts 
Um, um, I mean, they will always benefit you with the technique and everything, with the different philosophy and the angles and the movement. But I think, like you mentioned with gymnastics, it's like just working on your athletics, uh, athleticism and mobility and movement and cardio. Those are going to be, in my opinion, more valuable uh, than training other martial arts. Yes, you'll be able to learn some things in other uh, martial arts and for all, and this is just my opinion. Obviously, other people will can disagree with me, but from what my understanding is, and just seeing the sport and being in the sport for a little while, like strength and cardio is like so important, and then obviously technique as well. But yeah, I just think it can be easy to see the shiny objects of wanting to try other martial arts, and like by all means, if you're if you're in it for learning martial arts and just trying to enjoy the journey of all these other martial arts like fuck yeah and if you think it's benefiting you uh for your fight career like fuck yeah do it um but i believe in order to get good at muay thai you need to do a shit load of muay thai i think the two creative sessions that we talked about in the youtube video that i just posted the discussion that you and i had where we're talking about different tricks you can play on your mind and different things you can do for yourself to pretty much empower your mind to become more confident and to trust yourself. One of those things was spending at least two sessions a week where you're by yourself with no ex outside expectations, no outside stimulus where you're thinking about other people, you know, what, what do people think of me or to perform or to pretty much or at least keep up in the class to stay fit you know to keep your composure instead having these like free flowing sessions where you can get creative and allow yourself to fail a bunch of times and i feel like that's where you can build these little things that you can you know reveal to the public once you master them when you're training by yourself so i still love doing those sessions and i feel like you know 85 90 percent of my regimen has to be conditioning my body keeping those f fundamentals rock solid i mean in the past three weeks i feel like my kick has gotten maybe 50 percent better not even the fact that like oh i changed the technique of it or anything like that but i've conditioned my body so much doing pretty much like 500 kicks every session and you know two times a day then that ends up being pretty much like a thousand kicks a day and doing it that way it's made it so springy that by the fifth round, I can just throw my whole body as a unit and it and it feels like a machine throwing it in the fifth round. When before I can tell like by round three, it starts kind of slowing down and I feel like I'm losing the technique. So then the repetitions actually become shitty. So now I'm teaching my body kind of shitty mechanics versus mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm like coupling this uh, good repetition on uh, later rounds. So then I'm actually getting good uh, quality repetition in uh, with the quantity of it so I, I feel like those two creative sessions are awesome built on top of that like 85 90 percent of rock solid you know fundamental training that you will do on for the rest of your career yeah it's funny the the longer i'm involved in muay thai the lo the more i realize how important like the most simple basic things are like your stance and like a teep and a roundhouse and just like these single strikes or these two strike combinations or or fakes like it's really easy to want to overcomplicate it but what 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 works is the simplicity of muay thai in, in many of the, of the ways obviously it's a, it's a science in its own right but it's also the art the art of eight limbs and just being able to just use what you have the eight limbs in the most efficient effective way which is ultimately muay thai mm. the, the martial art and so if you just get good at all eight limbs and using those weapons with them then it all kind of just comes together but like you were saying just like man it, it's so easy like early on in my career i know i was guilty of this of trying to want to learn all these cool new things that like are fun to learn and they'll be beneficial but if I was just to do it all over again, I can't tell you how much I would be repping out checks with like perfect balance or kicks with like complete focus and intention on the hip rotation and retraction and being back in a defensive position and my hands being up, my chin being tucked, like the simplest fucking things, man. Because when it comes to get to a high level, it's the simple things that like 
like it's just granular man it's like such a small detail if your hand is like on your cheek as opposed to on the, your ear you'll get clipped it's just like it's a game of centimeters and it's a game of timing and the only way you can get really good at it is getting good at the the foundations and really just kind of building off of that yeah that's the thing if you can't find your jab you can't even touch the person and they're stopping you with a teep in every way possible then you do one of those like rolling thunder kicks. There's a highlight in one championship when Lerzilla does it, when the guy pretty much does a front flip and as his flipping Lerzilla just kind of like boops him with his toe on the, on his tailbone while he's doing a flip in, in midair and he just teeps him out of midair. And that type of mastery, I mean, a guy like Lerzilla with three, 400 fights under his belt, multiple time stadium champion, WBC champion. Uh, he has all these different tricks up his sleeve and he uses a lot of like Moy Baran and he talks about blending in like Taekwondo. He watches karate, he watches boxing and he, he has beautiful head movement, but it all comes from those things. Like when he comes out and he starts teeping you to the hip, like that lion fight finish, how was that quick flick kick set up? It was from the mm -hmm. teep. You, you pay so much attention to it that boom, it blinds you for those uh, techniques that are, what they call spectacular techniques and like promotions like glory yeah i mean uh, we, we can just repeat it over and over and over again until you guys get sick and tired of hearing it but like just get really good at the basics yo just like really uh dive deep into it nerd out like get like super geeky about the the small details of your foundation and your stance and your uh defensive position because those are the things that i would be focusing on again if i were to start over so yeah just wrapping up here we got a lot of good comments inside the the youtube about a bunch of different uh practitioners from all different martial arts from uh karate krav maga judo kickboxing um the list goes on and on so it's great to see so many different uh styles being blended in with muay thai and that's how like i mean that's how mma was essentially created it's a blend of mm -hmm. everything and uh yeah mma is like fucking awesome as well and we got so we're able to do also uh sponsored comments i think it is here and we got uh, a ten dollar from the definition of anarchy saying that his foundation was boxing too and that has helped him so much with being focused on his kicks again uh those really tight it's enjoying the fighter's body and you can't wait until the fight like ball cow is available and like just what he was saying too we we were harping on before too was just the idea of like when we got really good at boxing then we were able to focus really getting good at kicking and then once we get really good at kicking then we could work on maybe like clinching then when we get all that then we just blend it all together and try to make it flow uh nice and Nice and flowy. And then uh, we also got a $10 uh, sponsored comment. I think that's what, I don't know what these are called, but um, thank you, by the way, for uh, definition of anarchy and shrimp paste. Uh, boxing and karate feels, made me lose his, his foot arcs. Now he's flat footed. Interesting. I don't know. I feel like that's just like a. Uh, it's more of a genetic thing from genetic. what I understand. But if you do feel like you have, like tightness and tendonitis, like not tendonitis, but uh, you need relief in the feet. Like I, I've been utilizing the what the Thai version here is of a lacrosse ball underneath the foot. And man, the amount of tension that we hold in certain areas of our body for us to be able to like release them in training, man, it's such a game changer sometimes. These little things that we don't think about, just you know, when you're brushing your teeth, putting like a lacrosse ball under your foot. And just rolling it for relief is huge. I mean, we get a time massage, which is like the next level part, but you can always do, you know, things yourself at home. So hopefully this uh, shine a light, if anything, was a little uh, just thoughtful, just ways that you can uh, in improve your training, diversify your training, make sure that you're constantly improving as a martial artist and a student of the game. And yeah, we're going to jump into the Q&A session. We have a bunch uh, that we got sent on Instagram. And we also have some here on YouTube. So we're going to kind of cycle through the two. We're going to do 20 minutes because 
uh, we have to figure out like some type of system for this because we always get some great questions and we appreciate all your questions and we want to answer all of them, but we also want to get some sleep. All right, so let's do 10 and 10, 10 on the Instagram, 10 on the YouTube comments, and it's 8.15 right here in Thailand. So we'll go until 25. I can start with the first one. On Instagram, we have Young Holly. That's my girl from Connecticut, up and coming fighter, MMA. She's a legend. Some killer knockouts as an amateur. So, looking forward to her possibly coming over to Thailand. Uh, how do you feel about the way that Muay Thai is scored in the United States? And I'll let you talk first before I follow up. Um, initially i was in favor for it because it favored my fighting style very much though <laughs> and so i was uh, all about we have a bias a lot of the times huh? yeah. depending on where we're at and uh but now looking back at it it's like it's i mean it's still muay thai but it's just it's not like uh thailand muay thai which is obviously where the sport originated and everything and i prefer i, I like fighting five rounds thai style now because i'm more used to it initially when i was more uh uh, green to the sport i was all about um, i was boxing heavy and so in, in thailand boxing doesn't really count for much if anything and the west boxing counts heavily and so it uh it worked out for me am i a fan of it uh not necessarily now but that's also really biased because like i used to be a big fan of it because i won some fights that i probably could have could have went the other way if it, it definitely could have should have went the other way if it was tie scoring but since it wasn't tie scoring uh i got the benefit of the doubt what about you yeah i feel similar um i i like what the us open is trying to do and they're just kind of trying to bring all the rule sets into one just so like people have a standard and they're looking at the ifma and as the end result and trying to score it the same way that they would in the worlds mm -hmm. what my biggest problem is is that we have a different sanctioning body in every single state, every single prom depending on the state, depending on the promotion and the different judges and referees that are in it. And me, myself going to these tournaments, both as a coach and a fighter, it's like depending where we're at, depending who's scoring it, we have to fight in a completely different way, which cha almost changes the sport completely. So to me, that's the most frustrating part in the US. It's not like oh, here we're in Thailand, it's scored this one way, you know? Unless you're on a special show, like in Bangkok, fighting hardcore where you have to fight forward. But other than that, it's, it's pretty much one way or the other way versus at home. You're like, okay, we're in New York. All right, what are we going? Oh, and it's WK sanctioning? Oh, uh, okay. They're looking for like just pure damage and activity. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, you know, you're in the US Open where it's more like well-rounded, uh, which I like. I kind of like their approach. If you're going to score in any way, like, you know, give the kick just as much of the, you know, you know, nod as you do for like a two punch, you know, punch combination if they're just as effective. I, I like that a little bit better mm -hmm. than the guy that's like blindly punching at at the gloves while the other guy is scoring body kicks and the judges are thinking, oh, his blocking because it's hitting his arm. It's, it's like, no, like just like I kick the meat of your thigh with a low kick to, to hurt you, I'm kicking the meat of your arm to hurt your arm, to take the steam off your arm, to bruise your arm, to beat you down, to hit you in the body. And so overall, not a fan because of just the discrepancies and like how it's a different sport depending on the state that you're in. And I feel like a lot of Muay Thai fighters are not getting the realistic feel what the fight is and here in thailand it makes it for a very technical fight where you have to be balanced and you have to score those body kicks and the knees in the clinch and dominate positions boom well said next question we got is from eric carlson he's asking what would our ultimate weekly training schedule look like how often would you train muay thai and how do you fit in training, such as cardio and strength training so i'm going to pull up my calendar right now and i'll just tell you basically what i'm doing right now and uh you can see how it is now obviously it's going to be a little bit different if i'm like preparing for a fight uh right now i'm trying to balance out uh filming workouts for the fighter's body and my heavy bag stuff as well as doing my own training but generally speaking i train muay thai at the gym every morning i spar and try to clinch every morning uh it's about two two and a half hours it usually runs for now and then 
on Tuesdays and Saturdays. I do my strength and conditioning uh, work. Uh, I run every morning. Uh, between, I run as little as one mile uh, and as, as far as probably like three to four miles. And sometimes I'll mix in some sprints. And then uh, I'll be doing my own heavy bag and solo training, otherwise known as my uh, filming for the fighter's body uh, in the afternoon. So I'm trying to like, I'm trying to get as many hours as I can right now. What about you? I would say two strength and conditioning sessions per week two creative sessions where they're either drilling or solo sessions where you can really work on your own but you should still make it a full session where like you're really getting your work in up to an hour and a half two and a half hours and then the remainder of those sessions pretty much that type of muay thai flow where you're doing five rounds on the pads you're doing five rounds clinching five rounds sparring and really conditioning the body and the reflexes every single session like i said like 80 percent of the week with the remainder of the sessions being those two strength and conditioning and two creative sessions and if i'm having a fight then uh those sessions would be on top of pretty much doing twice a day every day for muay thai rather than if i'm not training for a fight like right now then i'm using those sessions as replacements to those traditional sessions and then in those traditional sessions not to make it uh so much of a grind i feel like uh picking like specific things to focus on which is what i'm really enjoying here at powerhouse that every day we have some some type of a focus that we're going over beautiful uh do you have another instagram question or want to keep banging out some uh youtube yeah sean this one refers well to you i think uh hunter perez nine fan question opinions on muay thai and four ounce gloves and with all the different promotions that are hosting it now and if you would ever be interested in doing it um yeah i would be interested in doing it i i was supposed to do it at one point it didn't uh there was <laughs> i was scheduled to fight i was cutting weight and then the ties had like an election and uh, i'm like oh Oh, yeah, I forgot. There's an election, so no fights that day. But uh, I, I like the prospect of it because it just uh, benefits my fighting style a bit more because I'm more uh, hand oriented. Mm -hmm. And like I was saying before, my knockouts primarily come from my hands. Uh, that being saying, said, uh, there are a lot more openings that you could get caught with as well because your defense and your shell, uh, when it comes to defending punches and elbows specifically, it's a little bit tougher to uh, make sure you're, you're blocking everything. But I like the, the proposition of it. I like the idea of it. Um, I'm sure I'll probably do it at some point. But uh, yeah, no, you fought with like not even four ounce clothes. You fought with like what, like a little bit leather of leather covers. Yeah, leather, <laughs> leather covers. So what's your thoughts on that? I like the prospect of it more now uh, j just because before I was thinking uh, just about the hands like, OK, it, it favors the heavy puncher, you know, because you can sneak things through the guard. But now that I'm developing more of a longer style, now it feels like, oh, I c it could be like a death of a thousand cuts from the outside, you know, using these long weapons and just, you know, even if it's hitting at 40 percent is doing a little bit more damage and cutting up the skin, bruising up the skin. And then also what I notice is that in the clinch that since you do have your thumbs now and you can grip a lot harder, all the positions that you get into and elbows and traps are a lot easier to get because you can really grip really hard. And I feel like that benefits my style a lot. I like utilizing traps and elbows. You know, most of my finishes are from knees and elbows. So if if I can blend that in, I'm I'm actually uh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I I enjoy the idea of it a lot more now. Sweet. So next we got Jessica Rolls. She's noticed during her sparring, she has a hard time getting close enough to implement knees. Any suggestions? Paul, you're kind of a, a knee guy. How do you land your knees? I've been having uh, a lot more success recently too. Just what we talked about is like I started, you know, on a streak of a lot of finishes uh, with knees and like especially entries, like transitioning from that long range that she's talking about into the clinch, not, not in the clinch itself. I'm going back to it, like looking at that strength. And I feel like being dangerous where you have to 
force the person to come to you. So like using those long weapons, like kicks and jabs and long punches and blinding them a lot where they shell. And that pretty much gives you easy entries into the clinch. And what, what I can say now, like don't make the same mistake I used to where I used to really like to come over the top and like squeeze in uh, to throw the knees, but rather like really try to manipulate your opponent's hands, like a lot of touching of the hands and palming to like fight for hand control. And then when they bite on certain things to create those entries and then always just keeping your shoulders up after. So that way you can continue with the knees and the elbows when they're trying to counter punch you. I like to personally utilize the, the teep is such a uh, great weapon to not only mm -hmm. Uh, gauge the distance and keep your distance but also for fakes and if you're able to land the teep a couple times and then every time you lift your leg up your opponent might freeze or might flinch or something and you can also just like literally step forward or do like a little tie hop or march forward Mar marching forward is really good uh for me you know if i want to get into the clinch i'll long guard and march forward so i'll be lifting my legs up high like they're gonna be teeps so it gets my opponent thinking that teeps are coming and then i'll extend my arms and a long guard to avoid any punches and so i can get a, a hold of them at some point um you can also utilize fakes to uh get your opponent to react i, I think one of the big things is just getting your opponent to react and then being able to cover the distance quickly um, like Paul was saying, instead of like coming over top, I like having my hands on the inside as much as I can. So when I'm doing the long guard, I'm able to ideally get the inner part of my uh, my opponent's arms and ideally their, their head. And then this way I'm in a better position because I can dig my head underneath and then start landing knees. Um, you could also uh, throw the knees from the outside. Um, sometimes they work really well. Other times I've, I felt like I've been left open uh just with the the, the range of it because if i throw a knee from the outside it's like a perfect counter as an overhand or some type of, of punch um so i tend to like to throw knees when i'm closer inside because i don't feel as vulnerable so i like to kind of swarm my opponent yeah that's what i was talking about like with with touching with the hands me being long um you know we had that one example of when i fought glory msg like i, I made one little mistake and and it was just trying to like be at that far distance and unload the knee instead like just touching with the hand so you feel like you have control and like weight over the top of the opponent so that they can't punch back because they have weight on top of them and like you're carrying uh, they're carrying your weight mm -hmm. so uh let's go into the next question here on instagram once again thank you guys for submitting all of these we have sammy barnes muay thai what's going on brother my friend from Chiang Mai up north. Looking forward to seeing you guys sometime again. Timing your meals around training twice a day in Thailand. How do you time your meals? So I uh, typically train fasted in the morning. Um, so I don't eat anything. I'll, I'll just drink some water and usually I'm good to go. Um, if I do anything, it'll be an apple or a banana or just something like super light and just to satiate myself and get something in my body. But but I like training fasted. I like training hungry. Uh, just like the, the idea of being hungry while you're training. It's uh, kind of like, I don't know, kind of appreciating the grind, appreciating the suffering that you're going through a little bit more. And it makes it like that much more, uh, I don't know, you feel more accomplished afterwards. Like, oh, I just trained with like nothing in my stomach right now since like last night. And uh, it's just like a little win. And so when I do train with food in my stomach, uh, that's digested and everything, I, I feel even better because I'm used to training on an empty stomach. So typically what I like to do, uh, was a question just nutrition in general or, or before uh, training? Maybe the best way to time meals because you're training twice a day and like most of your day is spent in the actual gym. Uh, okay. So say I train eight to 10 and four to six. That's typically my, my uh, training schedule. I don't eat anything until after training. Then I have like a smoothie at like 10, 10 30. And then I'll have like a, a full meal, full breakfast, brunch type of meal around 11.30 noon. Then I'll have a little snack at like 2 or 3. By a little snack, I usually do like apple and peanut butter, or banana and peanut butter, or like fried rice. Uh, uh, not like too big of a portion though, because otherwise it doesn't sit well with me. Uh, then I train. Then I have another smoothie. And then I eat a big dinner. Usually eat a big dinner um, of like protein, 
carbs, a little bit of everything. Um, but that's generally how I go. I, I haven't been eating too much meat recently, uh, but I'm starting to get back into eating some some good like chicken breast and stuff because uh, I feel like I need the protein. But that's generally how my day goes. I have a po- two post workout smoothies. If I eat anything before my workout, it's just something as simple as an apple or banana. And then I have uh, relatively large meals uh, in between and after my uh, evening training session. Yeah, I started supplementing a lot more, especially since getting here. And I feel like uh, my main thing for me is everybody knows uh, I'm the number one sweat champion of the world. If you would like to oh, compete bullshit. against me for that, you can do so. Just arrive at the gym. We will go bag next to bag, start from the same point and see who has the biggest spread slash like concentration underneath them. And uh, yeah, so that hydration part <laughs> is really difficult for me, especially. Uh, so I usually focus on the liquids the most. So usually right after the session, similar to yourself, I try to pack as much nutrition in into a liquid type of meal. So uh, it's, you know, I, I have BCAs, I have um, glutamine and creatine and just regular isolate. So like the purest kind of protein I can have. I, I don't like lactose. My body doesn't like lactose. It doesn't like to tolerate it too well. So having a shake like that and mixed with either fruit or juice. So that way I'm getting that sugar back in my body. I can rehydrate coconut water perhaps. Mm-hmm. And then similar to yourself, probably like 30 minutes later when I actually like rehydrate my body and everything's fine, then I put the solid foods in and, and i try to intake as much like carbohydrate and protein as i can and then in the afternoon similar thing <laughs> almost exactly the same as you just big meal at night because i know i have the second training session i don't like feeling heavy and sluggish especially if i'm working in the middle of the day so i try not to eat too heavy in the middle of the day so i can keep up work and my mind feels a little bit clear we actually do a meal prep here so my meals are usually uh tilapia with rice and avocado and that's my midday after the shake and then at night i'll have like the heavy meal where i'll either have like a pasta or i'll have more of like the fried rice chicken something like that where it's simple carbs and it's a bigger meal where before bed it kind of puts me to sleep yeah one thing i want to mention too is i try not to eat too late at night i make sure that i eat a couple hours before i plan on going to sleep Otherwise, I don't sleep well, and uh, it's hard for me to go to sleep. So, like, typically, if I finish training at 6, I try to eat by, like, 7, 7.30 the latest. If I eat any later than that, uh, I typically try to go to bed by 10. Um, so, this way, I can just get a nice early start to the day. And if I eat any later, then I'm, I'm just – I just don't sleep as well. So, yeah, nutrition is always a uh, trial and error because it always depends on a variety of factors, but that's generally how we how we uh, do our thing. So how are we on time right now? We got another... Maybe we'll do one on one. So do one more on YouTube, and then I'll grab one more from Instagram and finish. All right. I'll... Uh, let's see what question. I think this is the best question. Well, there's a couple of good questions, but mm, I'll go with this one. B.H. Smith. How important is it to a Muay, to train at a Muay Thai specific gym rather than an MMA gym? Well, it, <laughs> you should state your goal, but if the goal is to do Muay Thai, I think it's really important because there are when it comes to MMA strikers going into the something that's, you know, like a field of specialty, then usually you if you don't have those certain techniques down like really really solid that we talked about pretty much at nauseum throughout the entire podcast it's pretty easy to pick apart like to get that body kick out well to get that low kick out well and you know and rightly so because those guys have to really think about all the different aspects of you know stuffing a takedown so you you can't stand as high up unless you are someone like jose aldo who's you know a killer at you know, throwing flying knees or at takedown defense. Uh, Teddy Atlas just had to talk about this, how he used to not respect MMA fighters and how he kind of changed his mind because he just never really thought about it until he actually met them and watched their training and kind of helped some of them train. Is like, oh man, I just didn't think about how many 
I used to just think their boxing was so rudimentary, especially in comparison to the sweet science that he teaches. It's like, but then I started to think like, oh, but this guy has to do jujitsu. He has to look for the uh, submission defense. He has to look for the takedown. He has to look at a foot coming to his face, you know? Uh, and, and it just so happens that in Muay Thai, we're probably 10 times better at that foot coming to your face. Um, than the guy who's spending like a certain amount of time doing it. So there are two parts of it is uh, you're spending less time because it's an MMA gym. So you have to blend everything. So there's less time spent on like one specific aspect. And two is just a little less specialized. Now, if it's that or nothing, then for sure go to the MMA gym. Yeah. Uh, like you mentioned, it depends on your goal. If you want to be great at Muay Thai, going to a Muay Thai specific gym is definitely going to be more beneficial. If you're going to be trying to fight MMA and you want to just get a good stand up, then yeah, going to the MMA gym is going to be the way to go. Uh, I'm assuming you listen to the Muay Thai guys podcast. So we're going to be biased and say, go to a Muay Thai specific gym if you can. Um, but I mean, take what you can get as well. If uh, MMA or kickboxing gym is the only thing nearby, then it's uh, better than nothing. And uh, yeah, hopefully that. I have a caveat for you. So what if his asking is an MMA fighter and he wants to sharpen his Muay Thai? Should he go to a Muay Thai striking coach in MMA or should he go to a Muay Thai specific gym? I would say... Uh, both <laughs> i would say go to both because like you're gonna learn the right muay thai technique from a muay thai instructor but then you'll also learn the striking and the muay thai for mma because like we made a course boxing for muay thai boxing for boxing is much different than boxing for muay thai just like muay thai for mma is much different than di muay thai for muay thai and so it's good to if you're doing MMA to be a little bit in both so you can understand what works and what doesn't and also just get a better understanding of both martial arts. So are you along the same lines with that, Paul? Yeah, hundred percent. And I should also know that wait for us to come out with boxing for Muay Thai number two mm -hmm. to, to get it. <laughs> We've learned so, so much since then. So anything you want to wrap up with before we head out here? Thanks again for all the questions and everything. Much appreciated. But uh, what you got going on and what you want to leave on? We're having a really good time here uh, in Pukat, like really advancing a lot. And like we said before we got on the podcast that we're in a good rhythm. This is the first time that I know like every week we have filming sessions scheduled. I feel like uh, getting the whole system systemized for lack of a better word uh has been really beneficial and it makes me feel like really fulfilled and really good to be able to mix work and the tr like really hard training in where i feel like i can train super hard to the point where i still have energy to be able to pass it along so we're putting out really good stuff at the striking academy coming out right now like pretty much like teaching systems for every weapon and like breaking it down from the beginning to the end of how to drill it out and then hopefully teach you how to get it into the ring or a sparring situation so you can check that out moisetechnician.com slash striking academy maybe i'll come up with like a promo code for whoever only listens to the podcast to hook you guys up mm. and it's a perfect place to mix in with uh sean's workouts i see a lot of people in the group i just i just joined the group uh in, inside the facebook group talking about the hit workouts killing them it, it sounds like you're the new uh p90x guy <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well i just got so tired of seeing like these shitty ass cardio kickboxing on youtube having like millions of views teaching horrible technique that could like fucking injure people and give them this false sense of confidence i'm like you know what i'm gonna like make real workouts with real techniques and like do this shit right so it's been fun um the hit workouts and the cardio core workouts have been like I i've had to take those back a little bit i'm only doing where i'm fate so every month is a new phase right and every month is a sp specific focus so like month two is balance and and uh control uh month five i, I think is 
is a uh, boxing focus where we try to emulate like Tyson and Ali. Month uh, six is kicking like a Thai uh, Sanchai workout. Now I'm doing is a fight like workout. So it's gonna be like fight like workout. So I'm breaking down the fights uh, throughout workout's career and creating workouts around them. And I'm I'm having a lot of fun with it, and I'm excited to be doing that. But the the hit workouts, man, they, they fucking wipe me out. And then I'm training already and then trying to do that on top of everything uh and my strength and conditioning it's just a little too much so i had to tone it down a little bit with that but the new content that i have coming out uh, i'm really excited about because it's uh it's just unique because like we talk about creating your own fighting style and everything right one of the best ways to create your own fighting style is learn from the best fighters in the world and take what works for you and added to your style. So this is essentially we're dissecting Bork House fight style, what techniques, what combinations, uh, what tactics won him the K1 Max titles and made him the most popular Muay Thai fighter in the world. And then you're drilling the shit out of that and you're getting good at that and you're getting a good understanding of that. So uh, it's good for my training. It's good for everyone's training who's doing that. So make sure you go to thefightersbody.com if you haven't already. Uh, if it's open at the time of this recording, you can sign up. Otherwise, you can sign up for the wait list. But uh, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm in a good routine as well. Like you said, Paul, uh, coming out with good content. I'm trying to come out with YouTube once a week. I saw you're coming out with some YouTube videos as well. And yeah, the Striking Academy, I'm a part of that group. And I see all that stuff that you post in there. It's really intricate, detailed stuff. Uh, that often goes overlooked. And so everyone in there also seems very uh, uh, just into it, just very uh, a student of the sport, if you will. So, yeah, if you want more Muay Thai, I mean, we're the Muay Thai guys, bitches. So make sure you check our shit out. And, uh, you know, we always appreciate your support. Uh, one thing is if uh, you – one thing that's really important is if you find these – uh, podcasts or videos or anything beneficial and you have someone in your life or training partners or coaches or whoever who you think would benefit from it do them a favor by sharing this kind of stuff with them because a lot of people are going through tough times right now and it's important to surround yourself with some type of purpose some type of uh, positive environment and hopefully we can supply that in one form or another through the the activities of like the workouts that we film or the techniques and the the mindset stuff or just the community that we're able to create with our online community so uh yeah much love for everyone who listens to the podcast follows our stuff on youtube and everything it uh does not go unnoticed that's for sure yeah thank you guys um uh, make sure that you Follow us on social media as well, like these Instagram questions, these YouTube questions. Make sure you subscribe to Sean's channel on YouTube, and then you can follow me at Muay Thai Technician on Instagram. So when we have our guest next week, we'll probably have Miriam on, and then we'll have some other special guests lined up. But in between then, we love discussing these topics that you guys are pondering about and want your questions answered. So make sure that you submit them there and just stay in contact. Uh, I answer all my emails. I answer almost every single message it doesn't go unnoticed as sean said so thank you guys for the love muay thai guys episode i think number 138